Good afternoon, and welcome to today's uh, ENMU Reads lecture. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, this is kind of a unique situation, of course, with uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but uh, uh, I'm happy to speak with you today. My name is Dr. Roy Kep. I am an assistant professor of history, modern European history here at Eastern New Mexico University. And what I'm going to talk about today, uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about today, is something I call the tr uh, a troubled legacy. Uh, Germany confronts its Nazi past. Now, for a lot of countries that have gone through either totalitarian uh, regimes or uh, have been beset by problems of dictatorship and war, uh, the, de uh, the process of dealing with the past is something that has often been fraught uh, and Germany was no exception. Germany is one of those countries that has actually dealt with it a lot better than most, but it was a long process, one that took uh, many decades uh, and went through several iterations and generations uh, before you have uh, the kind of uh, state that takes responsibility today. The picture that you see on the first slide here, the title slide, is actually of a protest uh, uh, concern, uh, that surrounds the Wehrmacht exhibition. Uh, this one was from uh, the Wehrmacht exhibition of 2002. I'm going to talk a lot more about that a little bit later. The Wehrmacht exhibition was one of those uh, instances where Germany is trying to confront its past, particularly the past with its military, and it promoted a lot of heated demonstrations on either side, uh, which shows that even today, and this is a picture from 2002 uh, in Munich, shows that even today uh, this is still a contested past. Uh, and so uh, that is what we're going to be taking a look at uh, today. The, there are three real kind of basic uh, eras in terms of Germany's confrontation with its Nazi past. The first one occurs immediately after the Second World War, and it was one that the Germans didn't do themselves. Uh, after World War II, Germany was uh, had been conquered, it had been divided and occupied by the four victorious powers, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, each had their own zone of occupation. Now, in terms of eradicating Nazism, one of the things that the Allied powers were keen to do was a, uh, a two-step process. One was to hold the major Nazi leaders uh, res who were responsible for starting World War II and committing all of the atrocities, most especially the Holocaust, bring them to trial and bring them to justice. This was something that was decided before the war, and it was decided to give the Germans the kind of trial that the Nazis themselves would not have given to their enemies. So this was far more preferable to what Stalin's personal solution was, which was to take 50,000 of the top German leaders and simply shoot them. But it was decided to hold a trial. And there were a number of war crimes trials. The most famous of these is the one that you see uh, in the two pictures on the, in the middle and then on the right. Uh, these are the Nuremberg war crimes trials. This is the trials in which uh, the top 22 Nazis, 21 because one of them committed suicide, uh, were tried for crimes against humanity, great, waging aggressive war, uh, and the like. Uh, they chose Nuremberg uh, for the site of the trials, one because it had a uh, uh, court building that itself was uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, undamaged by bombs, but also for a symbolic reason, because during the 1930s, Nuremberg was the city where the Nazi party held its infamous rallies, and it was also the place where the party uh, uh, wrote or kind of promulgated into law the infamous Nuremberg Race Laws, which stripped German Jews of their citizenship. Uh, and you can see the uh, 21 defendants uh, on the uh, in the mid middle picture are uh, in the docket uh, at Nuremberg, and the person on the far right is the uh, leading living Nazi, which of course was Hermann Goering. Uh, Hitler, Himmler, and Goebbels had all uh, already committed suicide. The trials themselves went from November 1945 uh, to October 1946. Uh, and they are important not only uh, in the history of Germany confronting its Nazi past, it was also an important event in the history of the development of international law. Uh, the idea of bringing the leadership of a state to justice once they had committed crimes uh, was really set forth uh, in this trial. At the end of it, of the 21 men uh, who were in, on trial at Nuremberg, uh, 18 were found guilty. Three of them were actually acquitted. 
Um, but uh, 18 were uh, found guilty. Uh, 13 of them were sentenced to death. Now, the Nuremberg war crimes trials of the major Nazi leaders was not the only trials that took place in Germany in the three uh, or four years uh, after the Second World War, during the period of the occupation. Uh, this was, uh, actually was the beginning of a whole series of trials. There was the doctor's trial uh, for those involved in the euthanasia program uh, in 1939 to 1941. There was the Dachau Guards trial, which was the first of a series of trials involving concentration camp personnel uh, that would be held at Dachau concentration camp uh, and under uh, basically overseen uh, by the American military government. There was the Einsatzgruppen trial, the trial of those uh, individuals who were involved in the various mobile killing squads uh, that, uh, had, that had carried uh, mass murder uh, to parts of the Soviet Union uh, and Eastern Poland. Uh, there was the industrialist trial, so people like Krupp, uh, Fritz Thyssen of IG Farben, and other uh, business leaders who had collaborated with the Nazis, they also were brought to trial uh, in these years. And finally, there was the high command trial, which tried a good portion of the German officer corps. Uh, so war crimes trials was one aspect of uh, eradicating Nazism from Germany. The second phase of this was a process known as denazification. Uh, it wasn't just simply enough to try the leading Nazi war criminals. The Allies were determined that Nazism should be eradicated from German society, and so the process of denazification was that larger project. Um, denazification as a process would prove to be very difficult to accomplish, uh, and there were a number of reasons for that. Number one uh, was that uh, during, the pro uh, during the period of the Third Reich, during the Nazis' rule in Germany, they had successfully penetrated much of German society with Nazi organizations. So for instance, if you had a trial lawyers association, uh, it was replaced by a Nazi trial lawyers association. If you had a doctors or a medical association, it was uh, superseded by a Nazi medical association. The idea behind the, and, and this percolated to every independent civic organization or professional organization. The idea for it for the Nazis was of course to bolt the propaganda and really make the German people kind of into convinced Nazis. The uh, problem for the Allies after the Second World War is that it made it impo nearly impossible uh, to eradicate uh, people with Nazi pasts uh, from various key posts within German society. Uh, much of the bureaucracy, most of the police force, uh, and many people who were in the civil service had either been a part of these organizations or they had actually taken the step and become members of the Nazi party or Nazi organizations or auxiliary organizations. Another factor that was a proved problematic uh, in these years was that each of the Allied occupation authorities, because Germany again is divided into four zones of occupation, went their own way. They didn't develop a standard uh, for the entirety of the country. So, uh, for instance, the Soviets and the French tended to be a little bit more lenient in terms of denazification, particularly if those people had certain skills that could be useful. The U.S. military government uh, in southern Germany was perhaps the most uh, uh, zealous in uh, pursuing denazification, and the British were somewhere in between. So how does the process of denazification work uh, in, German, uh, in Germany during the occupation? Well, basically, um, all Germans who were members of the Nazi party, uh, who were members of Nazi-affiliated organizations, were forced to answer a series of questions, a series of questionnaires. Uh, and you can see the front page of one of those. Sorry. Sorry, my phone kind of went off on me there. Uh, um, how do you not speak your work? What you see on the page on the uh, far left is the questionnaire that is used. Uh, by the Germans, or by the Allied governments to uh, question Germans about their uh, status within the party and within Nazi-affiliated organizations. 
And this multi-page questionnaire uh, asked a very um, pointed questions about their political affiliations, who they voted for, going all the way back to the 1920s. Uh, these questions of a personal nature made the uh, denazification questionnaires quite uh, unpopular uh, with many Germans. And, and once a person filled out these uh, questionnaires in the, uh, for the denazification process, they were taken to denazification courts. And those courts would then decide uh, one of uh, which of five categories the person, the individual in question, and this is one of these people being questioned by a denazification officer in the middle picture, one of five categories uh, that they could fall into that ranged from uh, major criminal, which meant that they were handed over to the military government to be prosecuted for war crimes, uh, through to fellow traveler, which was on the lower end of the scale, and then finally, to exonerate. And most Germans really wanted that last category. Uh, one of the <clears throat> uh, uh, cynical jokes that made its way in occupied Germany was that they wanted what was known as a Perzel certificate. Uh, Perzel is a very popular, uh, it's basically kind of like Tide. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, it's a, a fabric cleaner uh, uh, that uh, uh, was sold then and still sold now in Germany. And the idea is you got this certificate which is what you see here on the far right uh, of the last picture here on this slide, you are considered exonerated, and then you are basically washed clean with Perzel and uh, can now uh, basically uh, rejoin society and have a fruitful life. Now, each of these categories, by the way, uh, really had a tendency to, uh, uh, the farther up you went, the more restrictions there were on you in terms of a job, uh, in terms of your freedom, and that was, of course, uh, one of the reasons why the denazification process itself uh, was uh, so very unpopular. Um, that was one reason, of course, it was very unpopular. It was a very, very invasive, uh, uh, very invasive process. But there were a couple of other reasons it was unpopular. Another, uh, a second factor why it was unpopular for the German people was that it, they believed that the Allies didn't apply it evenly. The, um, it was, uh, many Germans complained that m moderate to even sometimes high Nazi officials got the certificate of exoneration. Uh, uh, basically what they argued and they criticized the military governments for was that the military governments, because they needed certain people to help rebuild the country, people who had knowledge, and those people of course were compromised, uh, by sometimes deep involvement with the Nazi regime, that those people were, the Allies looked the other way uh, while they get exonerated by the denazification courts, while many low-level Nazis uh, were given higher placings uh, in terms of the spectrum. Uh, and so these people would get harsher sentences, but the major fish or the medium fry uh, Nazis would get off. Um, and, uh, it was also unpopular because, again, depending on where you were, uh, it was carried out differently. If you were in the American zone, uh, you were subjected to a very thoroughgoing denazification process. Okay, denazification, the war crimes trials, that is the period of the occupation. That is the first attempt to make Germans really confront the past. That gives way to the second period. Uh, which is the first German government, or what is sometimes referred to as the Konrad Adenauer era. Uh, Con uh, Konrad Adenauer, the guy you see pictured, he's in all these pictures, but uh, there's a portrait of him on the uh, far left, was the first chancellor of uh, a, re a revived German state. Um, Due to the Cold War, the Allies had originally planned to bring Germany together as one country, and it was going to be a long, tenure process. But the advent of the Cold War in the late 1940s, partially uh, due to the Allies' uh, Allies' disagreements about how to govern Germany, uh, uh, laid the foundation stones for the Soviet Union to go its own way and create its own German state, uh, the German Democratic Republic, or what became East Germany. 
and the three Western allies to form their zones of occupation of what became, uh, what became known and is still known today as the Federal Republic of Germany, or as it was popularly known then, West Germany. Uh, Conrad Adenauer uh, is, well, became the first chancellor of this new German state on, in September of 1949 with the adoption of the Constitution and the first major elections. Uh, Adenauer, uh, as you can see in the picture, was a man of advanced age. Uh, he was 73 when he became chancellor. He was already had been a, he had been a major political figure in Germany. Uh, going back to the Weimar period, he had actually gotten his start in politics uh, in the Kaiser uh, in the period of the Kaiser's Germany. But he really becomes a major political figure in the 1920s as the mayor of Cologne. Uh, one of the few uh, German uh, major political German figures who really supported uh, the Republic uh, and was a prominent critic uh, of the kind of nationalist bent of some of the leaders of the Weimar Republic. Uh, Adenauer had been replaced uh, by the Nazis as mayor in 1933, and like so many Germans, uh, he spent the entirety of the Nazi regime of the Third Reich basically kind of retreating into an inner private life. He doesn't oppose the Nazis, he doesn't resist, uh, but, he, uh, uh, but he is not actually part of the regime itself. One of the things that brought look, Adenauer uh, at an advanced age back into prominence after World War II was that he spoke out quite harshly against the Nazis. Uh, he uh, uh, impressed many of the Allied occupation authorities, particularly the Americans, with the forcefulness of his denunciations of what had happened uh, during the Third Reich. Now, Adenauer was always very careful in how he did this. Um, Adenauer, uh, Adenauer's denunciations of Nazis in many ways reflected his, um, his views of where Germany should go after the war. Adenauer wanted, the Nazi, uh, wanted Germany to orient itself towards the West rather than do the traditional German thing of being kind of a separate and apart country that is kind of between the democracies of, the West, of Western Europe and the autocracies of the East, which had been uh, kind of the way Germany had posi positioned itself uh, going back to Bismarck. So he wants to orient Germany to the West. So one of the things that Adenauer does in his denunciation of the Nazi regime is that he always points out that the Nazis are basically un-German. Uh, that the Nazis were this kind of uh, aberration that had come about, uh, that had uh, been in defiance of German traditions. Uh, he uh, also blamed it heavily on Prussianism. Uh, being from the Rhineland, he of course had very uh, poor opinion of the Prussians, and of course it helped that Prussia was no longer a state after World War II. Uh, but Adenauer only goes to a point uh, in his denunciations, and, and you'll see this as he becomes chancellor. Uh, one of the paradoxes uh, that Adenauer faces, he becomes the head of the Christian Democratic Union, which was a new party founded after World War II based on some old parties previously. Uh, Adenauer's party, the Christian Democratic Union, and its Bavarian sister party, the Christian Social Union, uh, were the conservative parties uh, in the German, new German political spectrum. Uh, there were parties in the middle, the Free Democrats, there of course was the big party on the left, the SPD, uh, which of course had been revived after World War II. The paradox for Adenauer is that the people who vote CDU, uh, a good many of them will, were people who had pulled the lever for the Nazis in the early 1930s as the Nazis are coming to power. Uh, and Adenauer and the other politicians in the CDU are aware of this. They are aware of this contradiction. But the people who had voted, because the Federal Republic, the people who found the Federal Republic had lived through the Third Reich, the initial uh, people who are involved uh, in the, uh, who are the, the voters in the Federal Republic are people who had been alive during the Nazi regime. So Adenauer's party is the one that's going to have the most likely Nazi voters. So it means that uh, Adenauer and the CDU, they can't really have a full reckoning, a real reckoning with the Nazi past, uh, the way that the SPD uh, had wanted uh, and advocated for in the late 1940s, which is one of the reasons why people
uh, tended to reject them. Uh, at birth. One of the reasons why Germans would reject them at the polls. There are other uh, reasons, but we don't have the time to get into that. Adenauer's policy was always kind of careened between uh, coming to terms with the past, but also a fair amount of amnesty and forgetting. Uh, one of the first things that Adenauer's government did was it ended the process of denazification. If you had not been questioned in the denazification process, you were not going to be uh, after 1949. Uh, in addition, uh, in 1940, or 1950, for all German, West Germans who were in the process of having to go to trial for being in the various categories, uh, Adenauer offered a general amnesty for those people. He also urged the Allied High Commissioners who had responsibility for those Germans who had been tried and convicted by denazification courts uh, and were holding them prisoner for various sentences. He urged uh, clemency for those who were convicted, particularly if they were prominent Germans or they were people who were members of the German military. Finally, uh, in 1952, and something that was controversial at the time, uh, Adenauer pensioned off much of the old German civil service, which had served under the Nazis. Uh, the, these were people, uh, and it was, uh, there was a justification that Adenauer gave for this, uh, the people who had served the Third Reich shouldn't serve the Federal Republic. He got them out of government service. Uh, but critics, of course, pointed out that he gave them full pensions in the process of doing it. The other aspect to this, though, is this process of coming to terms uh, with the past. Now, Adenauer got quite a lot right. Uh, so far, we've been rather critical of him, but he did get quite a lot right. Adenauer, of course, as we mentioned, condemned without reservation uh, the Nazi era and condemned it as a criminal regime. The historian Jeffrey Perk has often said that uh, due to Adenauer's uh, denunciations, there really was no public space left uh, for the revival of a neo-Nazi movement within the country. He also had removed many of the overt Nazis uh, from the West German government. Now, there are a couple of exceptions, the most famous uh, of which was the Hans Kulovka affair, where uh, Adenauer's own chief of staff in his office uh, had been a high-ranking official in the German Ministry of Justice and had written uh, part of the commentaries for the uh, Nuremberg race laws in 1935, but most of the overt Nazis had been removed. Uh, he also set up a process, and perhaps this is most important, in which the victims of Nazism would be compensated uh, by the West German government. This is the and I'm not going to use the German word. This is a very long word in German, and not too many people know German, so I'm not going to use the term. But it translates into English as coming to terms with the past. And this is this process of paying and recompensating the victims of the Nazi regime. There were two major phases of this. The first occurs in 1952. 1952, uh, Adenauer met with Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, uh, the two men, uh, two men are pictured in the middle picture uh, for a series of conferences to discuss uh, compensation for the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. Uh, this was eventually uh, agreed to, it was formalized uh, in a treaty, uh, and West Germany beginning in the 1950s and for many decades after that, and I think some, time, uh, some of this is still going on, uh, began to pay uh, the victims of the Holocaust. Basically, it paid Israel, and Israel compensated them uh, for what had happened uh, to, the, uh, the, to the survivors and to their loved ones. Uh, the passage of the vote uh, the, to, for, the, for the payments was itself a very difficult vote. Uh, Adenauer actually split his own party. Many members of his party opposed uh, uh, cash payments to the Israelis. And Adenauer actually had to turn to his political enemies to get the bill actually passed and to get the payments going forward. The other aspect to this was a process known, uh, uh, the other aspect of coming to terms with the past uh, begins in the late 1950s. In the late 1950s, as West Germany becomes more accepted, becomes more intertwined in the growing European community, Adenauer begins a process of compensating the victims of Nazism in the Western European countries, not the Eastern European countries, 
because again, Cold War uh, factors are a major uh, impediment to that. Uh, uh, the Eastern European countries, which, which, which is where the Nazis committed most of their atrocities, compensation for them would have to wait till the end of the Cold War. But the end of the late 1950s, West Germany compensated France, Belgium, Dutch, uh, Great Britain, uh, and the individual citizens of those countries who had been victims of Nazi crimes. Uh, mostly, uh, most of the people who were victims of Nazi crimes in Western Europe uh, were people who had been dragooned into, basically kidnapped, to work as slave labor in German uh, factories, which was a, a practice that uh, went on uh, during the war years uh, in Nazi Germany. Um, so that is uh, one of the things in which Adenauer uh, does in terms of coming to terms with the past. But Adenauer's era was also important in Germany for how society started to grapple uh, with uh, the crimes of the Nazi regime. Uh, in the 1950s, in the first years of independence, uh, German, West Germans began to uh, try and uh, come to terms with what had happened in the Nazi years, and there are a number of uh, important developments that occur. One is, uh, on a societal level, Germans engage uh, in a number of myths. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the cultural things that was most important in this was the uh, uh, kind of retreat into an idyllic past. You can see that in the two pictures on the upper right. Those are both stills uh, from German films. There was a kind of whole genre of German films known as the Heimat films. Films that uh, depicted an, uh, uh, a cheerful, uh, rural, uh, mythic past, very apolitical, uh, and uh, this is a process, by the way, that occurs all over Europe, so German, West Germany wasn't alone in this. The a late historian, late uh, Tony Jutt, uh, once wrote that this is a process that happened in the 1950s all over Europe. After the first few post-war years, many Europeans simply shut down about the war years, even in countries that had won the war. Uh, as uh, because of the process of rebuilding and getting back to normal life uh, seemed to take greater precedence. So there's, there was this retreat into kind of a, a coziness uh, uh, of domestic life. That was one aspect to it. Another myth that many Germans on a societal level begin to tell themselves is that the Nazis had seized power against the will of the German people. Uh, that the Nazi, uh, again, this uh, was something that was engaged in widely. It had its academic uh, uh, components to this, uh, as well as a governmental component to it. The idea was that the Nazis were this un-German force that had come into being. Uh, they also claimed that the Nazis had governed Germany as a terroristic state. Uh, something that, uh, and by the way, all this is untrue. The German, uh, Nazis come to power uh, legally, they don't come to power in uh, uh, a majority, but they come to power legally. They don't necessarily run Germany as a terroristic state. At least most Germans don't experience that until the final spasms uh, of the Nazi regime. Another myth uh, that the Germans engage in is the view of themselves, uh, they see themselves as victims. First of the Nazis, who of course ruled them terroristically, uh, but also of uh, the Allies themselves. Uh, they, uh, many Germans, uh, em many German memoirs, many German writings emphasize the Allied bombings, for instance. Uh, there's still an element of this that goes on in Germany. Uh, and also Allied brutality, particularly that of the Red Army uh, when it uh, invades Germany in 1945. And it goes into the post-war period when, with the expulsions, of Germans that lived in territories that were now part of Poland or expulsions of expatriate German communities throughout Eastern Europe. Where there were about 12 million Germans uh, that had been expelled, uh, 14 million, 12 million who make it to Germany <clears throat> who had been expelled from the Eastern territories. Uh, and about one in five uh, citizens in West Germany was an expellee uh, in the 1950s. So this idea of Germans as victims uh, had wide purchase uh, in Germany during that time. 
Perhaps the most uh, pernicious thumb myth uh, was that of the German military. Um, in the 1950s, the German army started to be portrayed as an apolitical uh, uh, organization that simply fought for its country. Yes, it fought for a criminal regime. There was no getting around that. Uh, but they had fought uh, hard for Germany. They fought patriotically for Germany. And most importantly, they had fought honorably for Germany. Uh, there are a couple of factors uh, for this, the creation of this myth. One, in the 1950s, many of the surviving German generals, people like Heinz Guderian and Erich von Manstein, uh, start to publish their memoirs uh, in which they really kind of play up this aspect of it. Uh, it also was uh, something that was fostered to a certain extent by the West German government and also by the Allied powers. Um, because in the 1950s, uh, as the Cold War continues, uh, there is an attempt, <clears throat> a successful attempt, to rebuild the German military. Now, the idea originally had been that Germany would be a demilitarized state, but the Cold War kind of put, uh, put that plan on hold. And by the early 1950s, as the Cold War extends to Asia with the Korean War, uh, the Western allies, particularly the United States, begin to insist, you know, if we're gonna defend Europe, the Germans have to be armed. And so in 1955, uh, the uh, German, uh, the modern German military, the Bundeswehr, was created. This uh, military, uh, to give this military unit, this new military organization, a kind of proud military tradition, uh, it was emphasized both in the Bundeswehr's own writings, but also in amongst the Allies, that the German military had fought honorably uh, in the Second World War. Of course, overt Nazis were prevented uh, from joining those. So that is uh, this process of coping with the Nazi past uh, in the Adenauer era. The last period is the one that leads to our modern, uh, our current uh, period, and it begins in the 1960s. Now, um, one of the things that the Adenauer government had done in the 1950s was put on hold, even though they had promised to continue it, they put on hold the trials of Nazi war criminals. Much to the dismay of West Germany's uh, allies, much to the dismay of the Israelis, and there was a great deal of pressure put on uh, Adenauer to revive those prosecutions. In 1958, one of the things that happened was that Adenauer was forced to create a new prosecution office. It's sometimes referred to as the Ludwigsburg uh, Prosecution Office. Uh, this was led by a man by a uh, lawyer by the name of Bauer, who himself was a, a German Jew who had survived the Holocaust. And he had a number of young crusading lawyer types working in the office. And they began to actually start to investigate all those Germans who had not been caught up in the initial dragnet, and even those who had been, but somehow managed to get away. Uh, in the immediate post-war years. They worked often without a lot of fanfare and not without, without a lot of support for the first couple of years in the office. Their work was significantly enhanced uh, and they gained a great deal of flexibility from events outside of Germany. 1960, Adolf Eichmann uh, who himself uh, had been at the Wannsee Conference in 1941, or 1942 and had overseen the uh, transportation of Jews to the death camps, particularly of Auschwitz, uh, who, who had escaped justice and had actually escaped Germany after the war, uh, had been found in Argentina, discovered in Argentina by uh, the Israelis, and in 1960 they undertook an operation to capture him and brought him back to trial. And that is a picture on the left of, the Eich of Eichmann in Jerusalem uh, at his trial uh, for crimes for which he was, of course, convicted and eventually executed. The Eichmann trial was put the crimes of the Nazis back on the front burner for almost everyone. It was uh, uh, the best analog I can say since uh, I'm old enough to remember it. <clears throat> 
very hit. I was actually in college when it happened, is the OJ trial. If you ever remembered the OJ trial, OJ trial was watched every day obsessively by everyone. And that's kind of how the Eichmann trial was. People followed it. It was always in the news. And it was particularly followed by the West German media. And for a lot of Germans, particularly a lot of younger Germans, the Eichmann trial is one of their first real uh, int uh, uh, entrances into the crimes of the Nazi period. This allowed for the uh, Ludwigsburg Prosecution Office to undertake a whole series of trials in the 1960s, the most famous of which was the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial uh, from 1963 uh, to 1965. Uh, of the 7,000 personnel who had been assigned to Auschwitz, to the Auschwitz death camp, they identified 63 men that had enough evidence to prosecute, uh, and they held a trial for them. And here is the picture of that uh, trial on the right, uh, the defendants in the seat with a guard next to them. Of the 63 men who were tried in this uh, Frankfurt Auschwitz trial, only 22 got prison sentences, and unfortunately, uh, many of those prison sentences, considering the crimes that they were accused of and convicted of, uh, were quite light. Uh, but it was an attempt to bring uh, these people to justice. And like the Nuremberg trials earlier and the other subsequent post-war trials, it produced a lot of good historical uh, evidence of the crimes. These trials have continued to this day. I wish I could say that they uh, produce uh, the harsh sentences for Nazi war criminals, but they usually don't. And so that is one of the uh, issues with that. Uh, so another factor that begins to happen in the 1960s is the, 1960, uh, the 1960s marks a kind of breaking point where you begin to have uh, German society, first West German society and then all German society, start to come to terms with the Nazi past. And part of that is due to the fact that in the 1960s, a whole new generation of Germans comes to the fore. This is a generation of Germans who had been born either at the tail end of the war, but have no actual living memory of the Nazi period because they were simply too young, or they were people who uh, had been born after the war. The key thing about this generation uh, was they had, they grew up in the early years of the Federal Republic. They grew up in the increasing prosperity uh, of post-war uh, German society. Like their youth's counterparts in Britain, France, and also in the United States, this generation also has a little bit more income, disposable income. Uh, and uh, unlike previous German, uh, well, not unlike previous German generations, uh, but perhaps more so than uh, the generation of the 1920s, they were far more attuned uh, to and far more had far more in common with their youth counterparts in those countries uh, than they had with their parents. Uh, so this was um, um, I've had it described to me at one point was this was perhaps the most Americanized generation of uh, Germans uh, before or since because. Uh, there were Americans all over the country, military personnel who were defending them. Uh, there was a lot of cultural exchange programs with the United States, uh, particularly, uh, and many West German youths uh, continued the pre-Nazi period's fascination both with jazz, and then as you can see in the picture on the left with rock and roll, which by the way produced a series of riots uh, and uh, concerts that took place in cities like Hamburg uh, and Berlin, West Berlin. One of the things that characterized this post-war generation growing up is that they heard nothing about the Nazis because their parents wouldn't talk about it. Uh, but beginning in the early 1960s, with things like the Eichmann trial, with the, uh, uh, finally the inclusion of uh, curriculum on the Third Reich into the school systems, you begin to have uh, questions being asked. This generation begins to ask a series of very uncomfortable questions of their parents. What do you do? What did you do in the war? For many Germans, that's a really uncomfortable question. Um, did you vote for the Nazis? Why didn't you resist? Um, why do you tolerate? Why did you tolerate the uh, disappearance of Jews and 
others and the slave labor and all of that. Uh, this, uh, at a very personal level and also at a very societal level, uh, produced a great deal of conflict uh, within West German society. And the fact, of, uh, the fact that uh, this goes on uh, marks a very definite, uh, not only does it mark a definite break, but it encourages these youths to begin to greatly critique post-war German society. Uh, so one of the ways in which this did is that many of the youths, of, many, much of the youth of the 1960s in West Germany began to notice the commonalities or kind of the, uh, if you will, the continuities between the Nazi regime and the Federal Republic. That's the idea of certain uh, public officials continued on after the war, like Hans Glopka in the 1950s, or Kurt Georg Giesinger, uh, Kurt Georg Giesinger, who became chancellor of West Germany in 1966, but it came out after he became chancellor that he was actually a member, had been a member of the Nazi party. Uh, and so many uh, West German youth, uh, in addition to criticizing all the things with the Cold War and the Vietnam War and everything like that, begin to criticize their own government uh, for not fully coming to terms uh, with the Nazi past. Um, as you go from the 1960s uh, into the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, public, uh, um, uh, public memory of the Nazi period uh, continues to grow. There are more uh, advanced and more sophisticated, for instance, curriculum on the Nazi regime in German schools. Um, after the war, there had been no public memorialization. Uh, the, the concentration camps that actually existed in Germany were still in use. For instance, Dachau was used as a prison for Nazi guards after the war, and then it had been used as a displaced persons camp in the late 1950s. And after uh, the displaced persons camp had been closed, the authorities uh, uh, in Dachau actually thought about tearing the camp down. A lot, there was a lot of public sentiment amongst older Germans for tearing down these uh, symbols of uh, uh, the Nazi regime. Uh, but uh, in the 1960s, uh, due to the efforts of the German youth, due to the efforts of Germans who wanted a more thoroughgoing reckoning with the past, uh, Dachau begins to be, uh, was turned into a memorial. And in the 1960s uh, and in the 1970s, most of the other Nazi camps like Sachsenhausen, uh, Bergen-Belsen, and others are turned uh, into memorials. Now, the East German regime had actually done that prior to the West German regime, uh, but its uh, memorialization of the Holocaust and the Nazi regime was far different uh, and, in many ways, historically inaccurate. Um, also, in the 1970s, uh, you begin to have some of the first real um, uh, instances of popular culture taking on the Nazi regime. Um, one of the uh, most significant events in the 1970s in Germany was the uh, broadcasting uh, of the American miniseries the Holocaust, a uh, 1978 miniseries that was shown on German TV as it was shown on TV in the United States, which uh, marked a significant and uh, set off a significant public debate in a very emotional one. In the 1980s, uh, the most significant aspect of memorial, uh, in terms of publicly remembering the Nazi regime, uh, was uh, the historian struggle of the 1980s. Uh, the historian struggle of the 1980s, um, this was something that uh, wasn't as well known in this country, but it was a major aspect of, uh, the uh, of uh, life in West Germany. It was a series of essays and, and also TV interviews in which historians went back and forth about the place of the Third Reich in history. It was set off by this man, Ernst Nolte, uh, a, a significant historian of fascism who argued uh, that um, the, with the exception of gassing of, the Jew, of Jews, uh, there was nothing that the Nazi regime did that was any different than the communists or what they had done under Stalin. Uh, he argued that the Holocaust had become kind of this outsized thing in German history and it 
because he was a nationalist and because he was a person who wanted to kind of create a usable national past, argued that this was creating kind of a negative uh, past. It set off uh, in and of itself a firestorm of controversy uh, and lasted throughout much of the rest of the 1980s. Since the uh, reunification of Germany, uh, public memory about the Nazi regime uh, continues uh, uh, both to be quite high, uh, much higher than in other countries, uh, but also to be quite contested. Uh, I started talking about, at the beginning of this, uh, the Wehrmacht uh, exhibition. And this, uh, because the Wehrmacht exhibition uh, was a, uh, a major controversy of the 1990s and early 2000s, I'm gonna kind of talk about it here. Germans have become aware of the broad complicity of uh, large sections of German society uh, with the Nazi regime, but there was still one group that was kind of left out, and that was the army. In the mid-1990s, because the first exhibition <clears throat> was in 1995, there would be one in 1999 and one in 2000, now there's a permanent exhibition uh, at the Historical Museum in Berlin. Uh, the Hamburg uh, Institute of Social Research began to uh, probe the records of the Wehrmacht to try and see uh, what it is uh, to really kind of look at this idea that the German military had fought honorably. Uh, the Wehrmacht exhibition uh, showed in pictures, a lot of them, <coughs> excuse me, that the German army rather than being an apolitical organization, rather than being a uh, organization that uh, had heard about the uh, atrocities but had not participated in them, showed that the German army was heavily involved in the atrocities in the East. Uh, Germans would be confronted with pictures of not smiling SS men, but smiling German soldiers with dead people uh, on other parts of uh, of the picture. And it showed, uh, it punctured the myth uh, of the German military. The exhibition itself uh, was quite popular with the youth in Germany. It was bitterly opposed uh, next slide, uh, by, and this is one of those protests, uh, of people who thought that this slandered the, uh, slandered the uh, memory of German soldiers, veterans associations in Germany were opposed to it. And there were demonstrations in Hamburg, in Munich, in Berlin, and when the exhibition went traveling, uh, there were protests wherever it went. And there was even at one point a bombing in one of the smaller German cities of the building where the exhibition was being held. Um, it shows the intense feelings that still exist and even when uh, a memorial was put up that seems innocuous, it can create uh, a controversy. This is what I've actually been to. Uh, uh, this uh, picture on the left is the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. It sits right in the smack of downtown Berlin. Um, to the right of the picture, if you follow it all the way you get to the Brandenburg Gate and uh, the Tiergarten Park, uh, but and also the U.S. Embassy, uh, but uh, the Holocaust Memorial was controversial when it was put up uh, because the artists who put up the memorial uh, put these stone slabs of varying heights uh, as a memorial and nothing else. And, and people, uh, a lot of people thought that that was disrespectful. Some just thought it was an abomination. Uh, but uh, it has proven to be a kind of very quiet and very evocative uh, symbol of a country that is coming to terms uh, with its past. And uh, this kind of stuff, again, continues to this very day. There are still Germans who are absolutely opposed to uh, an honest reckoning with the past, and of course there are many more who uh, continue to do so. Uh, that is what I have for today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me at the email below. Uh, if you are interested in further reading, here are uh, three books that uh, will help along with this uh, uh, topic.
I thank you uh, for joining us uh, for today's ENMU Reads lecture. And hopefully uh, when COVID, uh, when we get the pandemic under control, I actually looked forward when I originally had been approached about this to actually traveling to parts of the state. Uh, but I hope to actually do that uh, in future uh, summer sessions. So thank you for being here and have a great day.